it's uh, I guess a, a bit of a different webinar from our normal uh, uh, webinar series. Um, in the past, we've heard from uh, our development team on new feature releases. Uh, on occasion, we talk to customers and, and gather insights uh, from their programs. Today, we're kind of thinking a bit a bit more kind of broader afield uh, in terms of the question over creating a, a, a culture of sustainability uh, among organizations. Uh, being a part of the, the EdApp team for many years now, uh, I've seen many customers come through the doors and talk about how they can execute these sorts of strategies uh, with our bespoke authoring tool. Um, but we've had uh, this relationship with AXA Climate uh, for a number of years now, and um, Kieran is nice enough to come along and talk about some of the insights from that program and the great work that they're doing around the world, uh, and obviously talk about uh, what's happening in business today with regard to climate change and s sustainable action. So, Kieran, great to have you here. Yeah, great to be here, Luke. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Can you tell us, I guess, give us a bit of background on your experience uh, in the world of, of sustainability and uh, I guess how you came to this point to to work with AXA? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, look, I've been working in sustainability, Luke, for the best part of two decades um, my role with AXA Climate, by the way, is head of market development for the Australian New Zealand market. Um, but before this, um, I worked for um, an organization called the Climate Reality Project. So this is the um, the organization that was founded and is chaired by um, the Honorable Al Gore, so um, the former U.S. Vice President. So I ran his climate training programs um, in that capacity. But before that, I worked in ethical investment. Um, I've worked in government, state government, local government in Australia, um, the corporate sustainability area. I've worked with NGOs. So I've kind of um, covered all or lots of topics of sustainability. So water, waste, biodiversity, climate, obviously um energy uh but i guess running across or underpinning all of that was um education and sustainability education so yeah that's that's a, a quick snapshot of of my background i should um by the way acknowledge uh that i'm coming to you from um from melbourne uh and um, I'm coming to you from the country that's called Wurundjeri country for the traditional owners here. So I want to acknowledge um, them as the traditional owners and pay respects to their elders um, and acknowledge any Indigenous people that might be on this call today as well. Wonderful. Thanks for that. Yeah, we're both uh, coming today, uh, coming to you all from, from Melbourne today. And um, uh, we have many different participants from across uh, Asia Pacific, given the time zone, and potentially some from North America and Europe as well, those that are super eager. Um, it's great to have you here, Kieran. Thank you for your for your background there. Uh, do you think there's any chance we can get Al Gore to participate in the upcoming US election and, and help everybody out? Or <laughs> um Certainly, uh, it's a very interesting time for our friends in in North America, and um, I think a lot of people might have might ask the question, what the world would be like today if if Al Gore got the presidency a, a number of years ago. Yeah, it, yeah, that that's a question that gets asked a bit. Um, I guess it, you know, that election was one of those sliding doors moments when. You know, the history of uh, the US and probably parts of the world would have changed in a different, gone in a different direction had he become the the uh, the president at that time. But, you know, he's gone on to do lots of amazing things and win a Nobel Prize for an inconvenient truth and um, set up the Climate Reality Project and all of these other things. So um, he didn't, he certainly uh, didn't take a backseat after that time. But yeah, I mean... Um, you know, <laughs> Sorry the, to the, derail the conversation and get into <laughs> politics. Let's 
let's just leave that one Bring there both. and move on. Um, <laughs> awesome. So we've got a an agenda here. Obviously, we're going to talk about the climate school and the great work Kieran and AXA Climate are doing. Uh, the second section of this webinar is a fireside chat. We've got some questions for Kieran that we've actually pulled from our community. Uh, we're going to put you on the spot there, Kieran. Hopefully that's well, okay. Uh, and then we're going to flip over to the audience live and, and hear from you all and uh, give you the opportunity to ask Kieran questions, either about the climate school or climate change and sustainable action uh, more broadly. Um, so let's get into it. I think that um, without further ado, um, firstly, just a quick slide here, Kieran, I wanted to pick your brains on, on the importance of sustainability across business. So taking, I guess, a broader look beyond just training and, and using tools like EdApp to be able to talk to uh, staff and, and drive interest and, and action around sustainability. Tell us what the landscape looks like in terms of, uh, of these topics here. Right, okay. Well, um, let's start with the, the figure that you can see in, your, in the left-hand side of your screen. So this comes from a report from um, Deloitte uh, over recent weeks. And so it's talking about um, climate change and the energy transition and, and why it's important to workforces and employees. So Deloitte estimate that there are um, more than 800 million jobs worldwide. So that's a quarter of the global workforce um, that are highly vulnerable to climate extremes. So affecting things like, for example, access to clean water and clean air, and the, then the economic effects of the transition. That was a report um, just from a few weeks ago. And then closer to home, Luke, in our own backyard, um, research from, from MasterCard, um, showing that um, implementing sustainable business practices is considered by many business leaders to be the next significant challenge faced by Australian organizations in the years ahead. So their report um, had 76% of the respondents identifying sustainability as a critical factor for success in their in their industry. Um, and then, you know, sustainability and climate change, they are becoming increasingly important for um, for HR professionals and learning and development professionals of, of whom we, we, we um, will have quite a few on this call and the importance of the that connection between sustainability and recruitment and retention. So, for example, Australians are uh, the, the Australians that are either actively looking for um, new employment opportunities or or they're considering them. Uh, Forty three percent of the, those people said that they would not work for an employer that didn't have an active sustainability plan in place. And just as a side note, um, we've been speaking to um, Amazon, so they there are some organizations which are really making a big play in this particular area. Um, they've got identified roles supporting talent acquisition across the globe um, and linking that to sustainability because they see that linkage as being so important now already and moving forward increasingly so. Um, and then on top of that, we've got legislation that's coming through. So um, we've got mandatory uh, climate disclosures um, coming through in various markets. That's also coming through here in Australia. Um, the new regime is due to kick off in July for the biggest entities. Uh, and then um, the smaller entities will be phased in over the coming years so that by 2027, pretty much all organizations will have to report on their, uh, on their exposure to climate risks. Um, greenwashing is another area that we are hearing a lot more about, it, again, across all mar markets. Um, here in Australia, the regulators, so ASIC and APRA, are um, looking really closely at what organisations are saying and what sort of claims they're making about um, climate change, about sustainability, um, and even uh, what they're talking about in terms of uh, their ethics and, and their ethical purpose. Um, and really scrutinizing whether this is greenwashing or not. So for all of these reasons, look, these are um, this is why the organizations we 
um, work with are interested in uh, taking our training content and providing it to their employees and um, and supply chains and value chains and members and so on. Awesome. Thank you for that overview there. Um, obviously, yeah, very big changes happening all the time in this regard. And um, uh, it's it's exciting to see uh, AXA really take an innovative stance with the climate school. Um, okay, so let's spend a little bit of time in, in what the AXA climate school is, and then we'll reflect on on it and other initiatives in relation to to the broader topic of uh, understanding the importance of sustainability uh, in our organizations. Uh, in a couple of minutes, um, Kieran, can you just give us an overview of where the climate school came from and, and what it does? Right, okay. First one, first question first. Um, <laughs> Sorry we about. often get asked, well, we always get asked, in fact, why is an insurance company um, going into the world of being a training provider. Um, it goes back a couple of years to 2021. Uh, people on this call are probably quite aware that AXA is one of the biggest insurance companies in the world. Um, climate change and sustainability have always been important topics for insurance companies. And as extreme weather events become more frequent and more severe in every part of the world, then obviously the risks uh, do too. So we took a decision um, back then to train all of our 150,000 employees around the world on uh, climate and sustainability. And at that point, we looked around to, to find uh, a training provider or training content that was high quality and could be deployed quickly to um, all of these countries and, and such a large workforce. And, and it just really didn't exist. And so we said, well, okay, well, we'll, We'll do it ourselves. We invested really heavily to create that content and then, then roll it out to our workforce. But at the same time, we realized that, you know, with the urgency of, of the problem of the problems, so the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, sustainability crisis, um, in fact, all organizations um, everywhere would need uh, quality training content. And we had already invested so much into developing that training library ourselves. So it didn't really make sense having done that to just keep it to ourselves. And so providing that content out to other organizations going through a similar journey to us as quickly and as easily as possible, then that actually became a large part of our response to addressing the challenges. So, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the content? I see 150 modules here what is in what is in that it, it seems very extensive it is pretty extensive um so it's an online library of, of micro micro learning content as you see it as you say there are 150 chapters in there so that's about 40 hours um, of content um, and it covers quite an array quite a huge array of um, environmental and social sustainability topics so these can range from uh, the regulations uh, that we talked about before to supply chains, to biodiversity, um, from circular economy to energy. Um, it's also white labeled. Um, so employees and other stakeholders would only see the branding of the organization um, that we provided to. But I guess, um, Underpinning all of this, Luke, is um, our philosophy that um, everyone in an organization has a role to play in addressing sustainability challenges. So we don't think that it matters what their role is or what level in the organization they're at. Um, our approach is um, providing the training um, in a way that, um, that they can understand the issues but then quickly take that understanding and apply it across the organization and within their roles. Um, and, you know, being part of a, a global insurance company, you know, risk and data are really um, part of our DNA. So it's, it's really important to us that the content is scientifically rigorous and relevant. And so that's why a third of our team are scientists and they're continuously um, updating the content, actually developing the content. Um, 
you know, so there's content in there covering things like the net zero transition. And that explains how to embed the implications of climate change across an organization. Uh, there's content in there to equip employees within their roles. So, for example, if you work in HR, what will sustainability mean for your recruitment and retention practices? If you work in marketing, how do you avoid greenwashing? Um, likewise, there's content if you work in procurement, IT, legal, finance, risk, and so on. But at the same time, we know that everyone has different levels of awareness on these topics. You know, so, I, you know, as I said, I've worked in sustainability education a long time. And I've seen um, very often that learners, um, even with the best intent, they can be lost by the jargon or they, you know, they're presented with content that's full of charts and, and data and too full of doom and gloom. And so we've, we've really tried to um, tackle that uh, and making sure that the, our content is very positively framed. Uh, there's a big focus on making it, you know, engaging, even inspiring and making sure that it's accessible and gamified and motivating learners to want to keep learning. Um, so, yeah, I hope that gives you a bit of a sense of, yeah, no, of our approach, Luke. Thank you for that. I, as, as you were describing that, I was reflecting on many of the organizations that I talk to who potentially have built uh, their own content around sustainability in the past and obviously finding really credible, concise, well-written content uh, is the challenge. Uh, and um, yeah, thank you for that insight there. Uh, here we've got a bit of a slide on the reach of the program to date. Um, the, the Climate School program is one of the largest that we've seen on the platform. Um, many organizations who adopt EdApp um, either do it for their internal staff members or like the AXA Climate School are going out there and using EdApp as a vehicle for amazing programs such as this. So um, yeah, some really big numbers here, uh, Kieran, talk us through what we're, what we're looking at. Right, okay. Well, the first number is uh, has just recently gotten bigger. It was 4 million. Um, so this is the number of employees that have had access to the training content uh, around the world. Um, as I mentioned, um, uh, so we've been growing, you know, we, we've got a big focus, growing focus across APAC, um, now across Australia, New Zealand, and essentially around the world. And so that's the number of employees that are currently accessing the content um, in terms of the net promoter score. So this is um, the score that um, our clients have given where they said um, they would refer us uh, to um, other people to to do this uh, training. And then finally, 97% of the learners themselves said that they learned something new and useful within, um, within Climate School and our other uh, sustainability training products. So I guess, um, big picture, um, you know, our whole approach is um, trying to solve for these big, big planetary systemic issues at speed and at scale. And so um, that's why we, we are working with partners to try and um, provide the content out at speed and at scale, make, make it as available as possible to as many people uh, as possible. That's basically what we're about. Amazing. And, and some logos here, these are some of the current organizations who are deploying the program. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so you know, you can see a um a section, a cross section of, um of sectors here. So I guess one question that comes up is, um you know, AXA Group being an insurance company, being part of financial services, is this applicable to other sectors? Well, the answer is yes. So um you've got JLL in property and real estate, Accor Group. Everyone knows the Accor Hotels. Um, we do have a lot of financial services brands, obviously Microsoft um, coming through as, as a major IT company. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's, it's sector agnostic. There's content that, there regardless of what sector you're in, where you are, um, how big you are. It's, it's got content, um, even though these are quite big brands, um, it can be taken by an organization of any size. 
uh, really. Awesome. Awesome. So we have a little case study here from Schneider Electric who have deployed the program, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, when I first spoke to the team about hosting this webinar, what immediately came to mind for me was, okay, well, many organizations are looking at learning management systems like EdApp, and they're looking at content providers like the Climate School. But in very few cases, do you get to kind of pull the curtains and have a look at exactly what the material is. Uh, Kieran and the team have been nice enough to give us a bit of a look at that. And um, hopefully this will be kind of inspirational for those of you on the tool that have actually, ha actually had a play with EdApp in the past. So if I just flip over here uh, into the browser, are you able to see my other browser screen here, Kieran? Uh, yes, I can see it from here. Awesome. Great. So this here, what we're looking at, uh, for those of you who already have EdApp accounts, will know that this is the learner experience in, in EdApp. Um, obviously, EdApp is all about curating uh, programs of content, whether it be sustainability focused or otherwise. The ability for you to really control what content goes out. And as Kieran was just telling us, with the Climate School it is essentially a library or a catalog of, of material that then you can reshape for your audiences. Uh, if we just work through the, the material here and have a look, um, we can see all of the different kind of bells and whistles of EdApp activated with the content at hand. Uh, we have our continue learning tab here with the various courses that have been assigned out to this test user that we have up on screen. And we have our collections here. Kieran, you mentioned before the, the idea of understand and act, and we see those as collections here. Tell us again in, in, in 20 seconds what, what that means. Okay. All right. So um, what what our approach is, is that, I mean, you can't act on a, on a, on a, on a situation unless you understand it. And so... We think about things, I guess, in almost like an onion, right? And and on the outer layers of the onion, hopefully it's not making people cry, but um, <laughs> is the big picture of planetary issues. So understanding things like the great climate system, what what is, why is our climate changing? Um, the impact and the intersection with biodiversity, um, water crises, the one you've just pulled up, that's one that we've just brought out a few weeks ago. Um, and so that's this that's about understanding these big issues. Um, if you just go back out to uh, the understand again, please look um, and scroll down a little bit. Sometimes we get asked about um, uh, the S. So people talk about ESG, environmental, social, and governance, and so the S being social sustainability. Um, and people often want to understand. Okay, well. This is a, a growing issue, but we don't quite understand the relevance of us for, for our organization. And within um, the impacts on human societies, for example, um, we've got content in there that looks at the impacts on human health, uh, the impacts on um, inequalities between, uh, between uh, within a country or between countries. Uh, and these are increasingly growing in importance when it comes to sustainability. So that's what we mean by understand, Luke. Amazing. And then if you go from there to, this is going into the inner um, layer of the onion. So this is, all right, you understand the issues. That's all well and good. How do we actually act upon that and apply that knowledge within the organization? So some of the courses up above uh, in what you're showing right now, Luke, if you just scroll up a little bit, um, you'll see Taking Action for Biodiversity as a Company. We brought that out just before Christmas. The Low Carbon Transition. Everyone wants to talk about net zero transition, net zero 2050, 2030, 2040. What is it, what is it all about? How do we apply that within our organization? That's where lo the low carbon transition transition um, that's geared for that rollout uh, and understanding and uh, application across an organization. Circular economy, likewise. If you scroll down then even further, these are the um, the courses uh, for people in specific roles. So if you work in HR, as I said, uh, facilities management, um, IT, 
uh, all of these role specific um, pieces of content are super important because it's all one thing to understand the issues, but how do you actually equip people in their day to day roles to to take action? And that's that's why we framed it as from understanding to action. Great. If, if it's okay, I might just dive into one of the modules. Um, obviously, it looks like hours and hours of content here, but um, to show, uh, I guess, a micro lesson, which is very much the heart of our platform and the core of, of, of what we're trying to provide to staff members, this is an example of a micro lesson, uh, obviously using our dynamic gamified experience uh, and using the, the subject matter at hand here. Kieran, we we were talking just before about putting this question out to the audience. So what, what we're seeing here on screen is a quiz question that's presented at the start of the lesson. The objective, as I understand it, Kieran, is to just put the learner on their toes and make them think, think about the subject at hand before we go and provide some knowledge. Um, if anyone on the call wants to um, just answer this question here, climate change blank uh, affect the HR profession, Profession, sorry, uh, is already starting to, uh, will luckily not, uh, may one day. Um, and if we just participate here, let's say is already starting to, we have our outcome there. So um, just a little idea for you all, obviously we do have some content um people building content um on the call Hello, so I'm just a, a novel I'm idea there to explore how here's a video that's embedded i think that um when i talk to customers producing quality video content on any topic whether it be sustainability or ladder safety for example is where the heavy lifting comes in terms of production uh, so i love the fact that this program has some um, already these kind of uh, amazing video assets to lean into. I don't want to get too caught up in the content. I just wanted to give everybody a bit of a glimpse of the material so that you've got some kind of real life context to what we're talking about at the moment. Hopefully that was interesting. And of course, coming out of this conversation or this webinar today, Kieran is is at your disposal to, to show you more, I'm sure. Um, we've got the admin side of the platform here. I, I did want to mention this as well, if I just refresh. Um, obviously, the very special thing about EdApp and this particular program is the customizable nature of the material. So giving you access to this amazing library and then reshaping it for the audience that you have in mind. We'll leave that there and talk about it at the end because we've got a, a lot to cover off. Let's get back into the slides here and I'm looking at the clock. I think we need to get into our fireside chat in just a second. Um, but just quickly here, uh, Kieran, the Schneider program, uh, it looks massive, <laughs> to be honest. How many thousand people did we serve up here? Yeah, so Schneider, uh, we're talking 170,000 employees uh, oh. across 115 countries. And obviously then the complexity of languages um, within that some of which you can see here go oh, yeah and and just one thing that that stuck out to me was the the levels of certification novice advanced expert what what does that mean in terms of the implementation yeah so i guess um well first of all you can see that it's um it's called um is it showing up on the screen is, uh, so they so they've labeled this as Sustainability schools or Schneider Sustainability School. Um, some organizations will, it, it's totally customizable in terms of the content that we, and the playlists that we help organizations curate for their learners. Um, and it, I mean, when I say playlists, I mean, there's a lot of content, almost, well, very few organizations will expect everybody to do all of the content. Um, and so we we help them curate playlists like Netflix, essentially. Um, what they decided to do in this case was to create these three levels um, of uh, of certification or proficiency. And so that was um, where they came up with um, a novice um, level, uh, advanced and expert. And so that yep. then went down to, so novice was two hours of content learning the basics of sustainability challenges and how to act. That was then 
you're certified as a as a novice for them mm -hmm. for Schneider Electric. Advanced, that was six hours of content, go deeper into the sustainability challenges and how to act. And then expert, that was 12 hours of content. So that was exploring all the sustainability challenges, Schneider's own posture on those challenges, and then how to act. And that was wow. the approach that they took. But every organization we work with <clears throat> does it a little bit differently. Got yeah, Got you. Thanks for that insight. I think that I'm I'm hearing all the time, you know, how much content is appropriate on a specific topic. Uh, how you know, obviously, learning is is one part of each individual's role within an organization. And you know, how much should we take our employees away from their day to day to engage with training and upskilling? So that that's really interesting there. Um, Christina, do we have you on the call here? We're just going to get uh, Christina just to fire up the, the poll for us and make this a little uh, bit more interactive. Yes. Yep. I've just um, I've just clicked launch. So hopefully everyone on the call can see this poll about climate literacy that should have appeared on your Zoom. Um, so if you just answer that, there are three options there. We just want to get a better understanding of the climate literacy in your organisation. And uh, I'll let you take over now, Luke, and do you want me to pop back in with the results in a few minutes? Absolutely. That would that would be great. So let's jump into the fireside chat and, and uh, get Kieran to answer a few questions for us, and then we'll come back to those, those poll results there. Uh, let me just minimize that little window. Okay, so we've got three questions here for you, Kieran. These questions came from our customer base. Um, so let's put you on the spot and uh, and fire away here. So, Kieran, how important is sustainability upskilling to prepare businesses for the future? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess if people are on the on the call, then they know to an extent that it, it is important. But you know, I guess big picture, the the urgency and the scale of the issues, um, and the intersectionality between them. So. The climate, the the the, the extreme weather events, um, whether however that manifests in one's own um, region and locality, um, biodiversity crises likewise. Um, so the scale of these issues and, and the urgency of them um, are such that understanding them and and then acting upon them across an entire organization it, it's critical. And you know it's 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 almost at the point where um, I think personally that um, having your employees, uh, and, and I mean all, so all levels within an organization, board, C-suite employees, um, and also some organizations are taking the content to their suppliers, as I said before, um, and their customers or members. So all of this, I, I think um, the the organizations that are going to be around in 10, 20 years, um, those are the ones who um, are wanting to have their stakeholders and employees um, upscaled and, and literate on uh, sustainability and, and climate literacy. So, um, awesome. and, and, and by that, I mean, understanding the risks and as well as at the opportunities associated with sustainability. So sustainability is a whole new revolution that, that we're on the cusp of um, and we're only at the start of it really. Great, great. Thank you for that there. I'm sure you're provoking a few questions with our audience um, based on that response. So we'll hear those in just a second. Uh, the second question uh, we have here is, I guess, reflective of many of the people listening in today who are looking to solve this challenge. How do I create a culture of sustainability within the organization? Uh, what sort of tactics should I be looking at? Um, how do I approach my employees? And as we saw just a second ago uh, with the Schneider program, you know how much how much do we need them to participate? How to create a culture and not just have it um, simply be, you know, uh, an initiative of the business that just kind of lurks in the background? Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean. It sort of goes back to my previous answer, but maybe to flesh that out a little bit, I, I think, um, I mean, people like Al Gore, for example, talk about the sustainability revolution and, and it having the scale of the industrial re revolution 
but the speed of the digital revolution. And so we are really fast approaching the point where um, to an extent, every job will be a climate job. And so when we talk about, or when HR leaders that we work with talk about a culture of sustainability and, and embedding that across their organization, what they mean is making sure that all of the employees do understand the issues, number one, and then understand their role, what they are actually expected to do within that. And so that's why we've got this understanding uh, to action um, framing of, of what we do. And, you know, examples like I gave before where Amazon have tied their talent acquisition um, uh, uh, roles around the world tightly to sustainability. We're seeing more of that, uh, those kinds of examples pop up. And so um, for HR leaders, how, how they can do it, the how here, um, well, that's where we work really closely with them some of them will provide the content, as I say, out to everybody and expect everybody to do, let's say, an hour uh, in the first year and then do some of the curated playlists that we provide perhaps in the second year. Um, some may skip the understand stuff because they think that they've already got a, a decent understanding and they want to really get into, okay, let's we want action to happen. And then we create playlists where um, we are setting them up to um, implement the understanding across the organization and within their role. So it's it's really horses for courses on this one, Luke. Awesome. Thanks for that. So much to get into to here. Um, okay, the third question here is, is how important is sustainability for attracting and retaining talent? Um, obviously, if we talk about Australia, a uh, small market with, um, you know, very small population and um, talent uh, retention and and um, uh, acquisition is is really important here locally and of course around the world probably as well. Um, tell us about your your experiences with um, what, with this question here. Mm, yeah, I mean, so I. I... I try to keep abreast of the literature and the, and the research on these various topics. And one that I haven't, I didn't see much about um, a few years ago, but is, is rapidly becoming prominent is this alignment of values in terms of uh, ret uh, attracting and, and retaining talent. And, um, you know, I, as I said at the outset, I've worked across a lot of different sectors and, what I can see is, is a shift um, where people are making uh, decisions in terms of who they will work for or won't work for uh, based on the sustainability credentials um, of that organization. And, um, and, that's, uh, and so that was my own observation, but we're seeing that come through in, I mean, the reports that are um, evidencing this, they're becoming weekly at this point. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it sort of goes back to a, a question. So the, the, this is the, there is a generational element to this. And uh, as newer, uh, younger workers are coming into the workforce, um, they are much more. And this is this is coming through in the literature, too, that they are much more, uh, more and more making those decisions because they are seeing themselves in a workplace um, for a couple of decades and they want to be part of the solution. They don't want to be part of an organization that is um, uh, furthering the harm. They want to be part of this, uh, an organization that is part of the solution. Um, and this goes a little bit to the concept of, you know, people might be familiar with the concept of climate grief, eco-anxiety, um, and, and um, you know, my own take on, on those um, issues are they can be quite, um, they can be quite, um, What's the word I'm trying to find? Um, paralyzing. And people often are a bit overwhelmed with the issues sometimes. They want to actually take action. And the best way to resolve them is with action. And so um, that's why, again, those organizations that are, are tying their sustainability initiatives to uh, recruitment and retention, again, I think they will be some of the organizations that will be leading in 5, 10, 15, 20 years time. Amazing, amazing. Um, alrighty, they, that 
uh, I guess, uh, satisfies the few questions that we pulled from our audience uh, coming into this webinar. There are many other questions coming in from you all listening in. Um, uh, Christina, before we go there, to, would you mind just sharing the results of the poll there with everybody? Yeah, listening? yeah, for sure. Uh, so we've got basically 68% have answered our employees have a limited understanding of climate change. Good news is 0% um, was the answer for employees do not have any understanding. So that's really good. Uh, and then only 32% were employees have a good understanding. So it's, I don't know if that's what you kind of thought it might be, Kieran, but um, yeah, main takeaway there being majority of the people on this webinar think that their employees have a limited understanding of climate change. Yeah, I mean, that that does correspond to what we hear out in the market as well. And, and look, this is a this is a huge field of understanding and knowledge. Nobody, you know, I've worked with climate scientists. They know their stuff really well. They won't know other aspects of sustainability as well. So it's a huge, evolving, dynamic area. Nobody's going to be an expert in any of it, in, in all of it, I should say. I think that's a, a nice segue into the first question from our audience here. Um, Jessica has has posted, do you think this material would be suitable for sustainability professionals themselves? So uh, is there a branch of this material that is for the experts, <laughs> Kieran? Yeah, right. Um, Look, it is. I find I, I wouldn't. I'd always hesitate to call myself an expert. Uh, I'm, you know, I've worked in the field a long time, but um, I don't believe anyone is an expert on all the issues. So, you know, very honestly, there is there's a lot of material that I am I'm learning um, and picking up that I haven't been across uh, before. You know, perhaps I've understood it within my own area within Australia, for example. But I haven't understood it from a global south perspective or, you know, there might be a, a different um, set of regulations coming through in Europe than what we've got here. So I do. And we've tried to reflect as well as we can those differences across markets, across issues. Um, it's probably worth pointing out at this at this stage, Luke, that when we design the content, we're, we're also quite careful to not make it an AXA climate only view of the world. We're, we're conscious of the fact that we need lots of input and participation from lots of players. So we we go out consistently to industry, academia, um, and make sure that we're, what we're providing is what what is needed, and that it's current, um, and that it's that it's reflective of various perspectives. So I hope that um, answers your your question, Jessica. Good stuff there. Um, you just spoke about different regions just a second ago. There's, we've actually got another question here from Teresa, who's asking, uh, is the material customized by region or can it be? Um, tell us about that, Kieran. Yeah, it's uh, the, so the content is global in nature, but we draw examples from around the world. Um, and so um, and, and, the, and the presenters, for example, the one that we, you saw in, in the video, we've got a number of those with. Um, from different parts of the world. Um, we we want to make sure we're bringing as much diversity into the content in terms of the presenters, in terms of the content itself. Um, and so when I mentioned that we work with partners to curate playlists, that's where we will pick out the bits that respond to what whatever your organization's needs are, wherever they are. You might have people, a lot of people in Australia, you might have a lot of people in India, and then a lot of people, I don't know, in in Europe. And so we'll help you to pull out the right pieces of content for those specific um, groups of learners. Got yeah, got yeah. And then on top of that, obviously, the material can be customized by the organization themselves. Is that correct? It's 100% customizable. Yeah. Awesome. Got yeah, there's another question here. We, I knew that this question would come up. Um, how much does it cost, Kieran? Obviously, um, part of this conversation is is obviously we're talking about sustainability in general and the trends that we're seeing. Um, but you know, organisations can get their hands on this material, can they not? Um, the our anonymous attendee here, <laughs> go ahead, tell us who you are. Um, talks about 
an organization of 500 people, for example, can you give us any insight there or is it really a matter of, you know, what sort of content from the library they would look at? Uh, it, it, it really is. Um, I mean, it is enterprise uh, pricing. So it does depend on the number of employees um, and we've got brackets. Um, generally speaking across the, the libraries but it really does depend on which product mix so um, a lot of that 40 hours of content that's in what we call climate school we've got regulation school another training uh, product we've got net zero school which looks at decarbonization pathways across the hard to abate um, sectors the heavy emit emitting sector so it really I, I'm not I'm not trying to avoid the question or the answer, but it really does depend on the product mix um, and then obviously the number of employees. So I would encourage you to to reach out um, and we'll have we can have a, a conversation about that. Wonderful. Um, absolutely. Uh, for those of you that are interested in in pricing or or just obviously getting more familiar with the content, reach out to Kieran. I believe his his emails in the chat or we can share it at the end here. Um, uh, I'm sure that um, that information is available. Um, I don't see any other questions in the in the Q and A just at this moment, so I'll just pause and. Oh, sorry, I've just, Christina. Um, yes. I've just got one more from Susan who asks: Are there any oh. specific modules for legal staff? Uh, yes, there there are, Susan. There's a whole course for people who work in legal, um, and so that's spot on, squarely suitable to your needs. But we also have a course for people who work in risk. And obviously, there's there's quite a bit of intersection with mandatory disclosures and so on coming up. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the short answer is yes, plenty of content. Awesome. Thanks for that, Kieran. Uh, if anyone else has questions, fire them through. I'll, I'll uh, soldier on here with a few more slides. Um, but feel free to ask questions. I think that from these webinars, that's obviously the most important thing. Um, just to give you give everybody a little bit of context about how the climate school can be deployed within your organizations, uh, just a few slides here to summarize how you know many organizations that we've already spoken about have done. So, um, so of course you can talk to Kieran. You can jump on the AXA Climate School dot uh, com website uh, and explore all of the content, look at testimonials, et cetera, and, and dive into the material. Uh, of course, Kieran and his team would, would welcome a conversation. From there, um, obviously some of the people on this call will already have their own EDAP accounts and live programs. From there, you can basically pull in that subject matter into your account and start to customize it. If you're fresh to EDAP, um, of course, you know, you can build a, a climate academy from scratch. So it depends on where you're at with, with the platform. Again, I think, in, and we always kind of push these messages on many webinars, that the value of EDAP, and Kieran, correct me if I'm wrong, the reason why you guys selected EDAP as the vehicle for this academy or the climate school is the customization that comes with it. We know that off the shelf learning libraries, they tend to lose staff members because if you're not pushing content in the the language and and the the um, visuals that the staff members are are interested in or used to, the engagement levels drop. Um, as we can see with the visual here with the Suncorp logo, uh, a recent deployment uh, in Australia, Kieran. Um, Really, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, uh, yeah to support. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say. I mean, um, yes, spot on. I mean, um, when we looked around for uh, platforms, um, I mean, EdApp was head and shoulders above the rest because we know that um, ease of deployment and that kind of cluttered, um, uncluttered interface, I should say, um, making sure that we the content is easily deployed. Um, and can cope with um, all all sizes of organizations. That was really important to us. And yeah, so um, you know that's why we've been really happy to work with Edda. Your check's in the mail, Kieran. Um, <laughs> so just, just kind of mapping out this journey. Um, obviously, you would create your own 
Academy, you customize it, you can then roll it out to your learner audiences. You could do that using our out of the box features or connect with via integration where you where organizations have other LMS platforms. Of course, the analytics that we can generate from the quizzes, quiz questions and time spent watching videos, gamification, et cetera, are all captured uh, and then can be passed back to other uh, LMSs. So, um, of course, again, talk to Kieran and his team about this or, or reach out to the EdApp team and we can also give you some more info. Some key benefits here, I think I've said these things a few times now, Obviously, the editable nature of the content, uh, it really makes it powerful and compelling. That kind of brings us to the end of the webinar here. Uh, a little QR code on screen. This will actually allow everybody to sign up uh, as a learner to a short snippet of, of the program uh, to experience it firsthand. We did show everybody a, a quick preview of the back end and the learner experience midway through this webinar, but um, we'd love for you to jump in and have a play. Um, Kieran, anything to say about this demo beyond that? Um, I mean, yeah, just have a look around what the, um, at what's in there. Um, and just uh, from what was in, on a previous screen, actually something that might be a question for some people is, okay, do we get it? And then we you leave us to it, I mean, um, uh, the fees, um, the licensing fees actually include point three there, um, a customer success manager who actually works really closely with our partners around things like how do you do a launch? We've got the communications assets um, to provide for your internet to your through your um, through your uh, newsletters and so on. How do you actually curate those playlists? So we work really closely with you to do that. How do you keep the engagement going? That's that's a, a, a challenge uh, with any uh, training that's run over a long time period. Um, and, and so we, we work with you on the tactics to get the best results uh, and talk about other organizations who've done similar deployments. But yeah, essentially have a look, if, if you wouldn't mind jumping to the next screen again, look at, um, please do have a look at the, uh, take the QR code on your phone, have a look at it. Uh, reach out. We've we've put some contact details in the chat. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time today, Kieran. Um, and happy belated St. Paddy's Day on the weekend. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks, Luke. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thank, I mean, honestly, thank you for the chance to uh, to be on this call today, and um, thank you to all the participants who joined. Uh, feel free to reach out via our website or on my email address and um you know uh look forward to helping you all um embed sustainability through your organizations wonderful all righty we'll sign off here i might just leave this uh a uh, little qr code up for another 30 seconds or, or so if anyone's grabbing their phone to to hit it there but um thanks again everybody have a wonderful rest of the day and um we'll see you soon Thanks.